you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do in the future. Vote like your whole world depended on it. Voters should not be forced to go to the polls with their fingers crossed. They understand what peace demands. What America needs are leaders to match the greatness of her people. Campaign appearances are getting closer and closer together as each candidate tries to get in his best shot. Vote. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. It's going to get dirtier in these last few days. No apologies, no regrets. We will not be coerced. We will not tolerate being pushed around. Well, that was intense. <laughs> well, hey, good morning. We are starting a brand new message series that we are calling Citizens. And I thought today we'd start out with a little bit of fun. And so I want to I get things started off the right way. Uh, how many here would say that you are a good citizen? Anybody, anybody, a few of you, you're like, I'm not sure. I don't know where we're going. Good citizen, okay? Got has got a few good citizens in here. Um, you know, I'd like to do a little quiz. So I need a volunteer, I need somebody who'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm a good citizen. You want to be a volunteer? Anybody? All okay, right, come on up, Paul. Okay, let's give him a nice hand. Let's see. Here you go, Paul. You want to hold the microphone? Okay. Got a little quiz here. So uh, my daughter's school just kind of got back in session here the last couple weeks. And uh, one of my girls, they are in a government class. And so with that, they have, have to take uh, the U.S. U.S.? U.S. citizenship test, okay? And so this is the test that everyone who, who you know, immigrates legally to our country, they're required to take. And they're out of 100 possible questions. Uh, you have to take a test of six, or sorry, of 10 questions, and you have to get at least six right, okay? So we're going to see how you do a couple questions, okay? <clears throat> and maybe if you get stuck, we'll let you, let you, you know, phone a friend or ask the audience, okay? Okay, uh, how many branches of the government are there? Three. Three, correct. Hold, again, hold it up there. Okay, can you name them? Uh, Ooh. <laughs> the legislative. Yep. Got to put it right there. Is it? Check. There, okay. okay. The legislative. Uh, <laughs> executive. executive, yep. In the what? Judicial. In judicial. Okay, there we go. Good job. Okay. Okay, we'll do that together. Okay, here's, here's a harder one. Can you name... <laughs> Can you name the current speaker of the house? Ooh. Anybody? Mike Johnson, that is correct. Okay. How many members uh, are in the House of Representatives? Anybody? Somebody knows. Is it, I think, is it 450? I think it's 450. We'll have to Google that later, okay? You can, you can let me know. Okay, we're all wrong. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, how many Supreme Court justices do we have? Nine. Nine, okay. Can you name three? Ooh. I just know Clarence Jones. There, Clarence. Thomas. Thomas, yeah. Okay. That's about the only one. Anybody else? What's that? Kavanaugh? Kavanaugh? Alito. Alito. I can tell where you guys lean right now just by the justices that you named. <laughs> that wasn't test. Okay, pretty good, pretty good. Hey, before we continue our test, let, you're getting nervous. Like, oh, no. Uh, let, let me um, read to you our theme verse for this series. It will be on the screen. Philippians 3.20, it says this. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let, me, let me continue our citizenship test now. Uh, how many disciples did Jesus have? That is correct. Can you, can you name some? You got, well, Judas was the bad one. There you go. Then they had <clears throat> Paul. Any more? Uh, <laughs> John. John. Peter. Peter. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, how many commandments were given on Mount Sinai? Ten. Ten. Can you name any? Shall not. Uh, uh, do not um, disrespect. Oh, First of all, God is the first one, and, yep. and then second or the thirds are like, uh, don't covenant your neighbor's wife, don't steal, don't, um, don't lie, and don't disrespect. Your there you go. Good job. Let's give it up for Paul. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Great job. Oh man. 
Uh, that's okay. Uh, you are now a citizen. Okay. Here is, here is the point, okay? If you are a follower of Jesus and also you live in, in America, if you are a follower of Jesus and you live in the United States, you are, find yourself with the unique status of dual citizenship, Okay, dual citizenship. You are a citizen of heaven and a resident of the United States with all the rights, responsibilities, and challenges that come with that. Because at times we're gonna find ourselves at odds with those two identities. Those two identities, being a, an American and a believer, follower of Jesus, may come into uh, tension at times. And so what do we do when that happens? What do we do when that happens? Okay, we're gonna get into all of that as we go through this series. But first, I'm gonna do a couple of housekeeping kind of things right away. Okay, first of all, uh, this is week one of a four or five week series. And so I wanna let you know, if I don't offend you today, uh, come on back next time. Okay, because there'll be a good chance I will offend everyone before this series is over. All that to say, give me time to kind of go through this and unpack it piece by piece. Okay, secondly, I recognize that for some, uh, this whole topic makes you very uncomfortable. Okay, this whole idea of like, like talking about politics and government and church, like I've heard way too much of this already. You know, you've got friends or maybe your spouse, that they, they really get into it and they get all fired up and passionate and your eyes just start to glaze over. But they're talking like, like oh, no, this, this vote is really important. HB, you know, and they have a big, long list of numbers. And like, they're telling you why it's so important and your eyes just glaze over. Or, you know, you've already seen it where, where it causes so many arguments and disagreements or you've lost friends over the last few years because of political disagreements. And you ask yourself, do we really even need to be talking about this in church? Well, if you have a Bible handy, you can turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And uh, here's the reality though. Jesus talked about politics. Jesus talked about politics. I don't even remember. There was one day when Jesus was standing up before a crowd and he was teaching and someone maybe kind of raised their hand and they asked Jesus a question. And it might've been a gotcha question, but they said, hey Jesus, is it right for us to pay taxes to Rome? And, and uh you know, Jesus didn't, he didn't ignore it. He didn't say, you know what? Hey, you know, let's just talk about love. Okay, well, let's just focus on loving your neighbor. No, he addressed the question, which is kind of nice to know that even Jesus had to deal with taxes. Okay, like I'm kind of like trying to picture Jesus walking into an H&R block, you know, kind of a funny image there. But no, he addressed the issue. Okay, in fact, listen to what he says. We'll have this verse on the screen. This is from Matthew 22. He said to them, he first of all, he said, hey, does anybody have a coin? And they said, yeah, yeah, we got a coin. And they, they held it up and he says, Who's, whose picture's on this coin? Right, and they said, Caesar. And then Jesus said this, verse 21. Then he says, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. It's like if I, today if I were to ask you, you had a coin, somebody holds up a quarter and say, whose image is on that? You'd say Washington. And say, give to Washington what belongs to Washington and give to God what belongs to to God. What Jesus is saying, he's, he's acknowledging the fact that we have a responsibility to God and to government. And he affirms that. Okay? So the question is, then how should we relate as believers to government and to politics? What should that look like? Well, let's start, so let's start out by looking at the role of government. So Romans 13. Romans 13, we'll start with verse 1. And we looked at this a couple weeks ago in our last series. It says this, let everyone submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. And the, the authorities that exist have been established by God. So what he's saying here is, is that authority comes from God. Government was God's idea. Government is, is God's idea. And when we submit, we are honoring God. This is amazing when you stop, and we said this last time, when you consider who he was talking to. This is the letter to the Romans. 
And, and you think about, you know, the, the government in Rome, what the Roman Empire was doing at that time, the things that they were, um, you know, celebrating and the things that they were promoting and sanctioning, they were some pretty terrible things. And Paul doesn't say, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, Romans, no, no, no. Okay, I forgot who your, your governor was. You get a pass. Okay, when you get the governor that kind of leans the right way, then you can, you can honor and submit to them. It's not what he says. Okay, but notice he uses the word submit, not the word obey. Two, two different words, okay? To submit means to honor, to, to come under authority. But he's also recognizing that there may be times when the laws of the land, the decrees of our government may go against the laws of God and against the principles of Scripture. And in those situations, we have a long history of believers in Jesus civilly disobeying civilly disobeying, but doing it respectfully. You don't see Paul, you know, telling the Romans, burn down Rome. None of that. They are willing to face the consequences and say, if this is the law you're passing, you know, uh, respectfully, we can't comply. We will not comply. Okay, so what does that look like? How, how does that play out? We're going to get into that. This is day one, okay? <laughs> can't, can't jump into the deep end yet. We'll get there as this series goes on. Okay, so what, what does government, why does government have authority? What is government's role? Let's look at verse four of Romans 13. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do, if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So it's saying government, government bears the sword. Another way of putting that would, would be to say that, that government uh, wields authority. The government wields authority, and it does it for three main reasons. I put this in your note. Why, why does government wield authority? Number one, to punish injustice, to protect people, and to preserve order. Okay? To punish injustice, to protect people, and to preserve order. Now, let me ask you, does, does government always do a great job of that? No. <laughs> Why? Because the government, we, we are a government of the people. Okay. Have you seen people? Do you know people? There's some not great people out there. I'm going to use my filter. Okay. <laughs> Just in the same way, uh, does the church, do churches always do a great job of loving people? No, we don't. Sadly, we don't because the church is made up of people as well. But what makes our country and our government great, our unique is our framework. What makes our country unique is our framework. Um, this is a few years ago. I was hanging out at a buddy's house when my girls were younger and uh, I had my kids there and another family was there and ki kids were all running around having a good time. And my buddy had this picnic table out in his yard and the kids were all like running and like, you know, climbing up on the seat and jumping on the top and then jumping down and running and jumping on it. And I was starting to kind of get a little nervous. And my buddy said, hey, don't worry about it. it, it I built it right. It can handle it. It can handle it. I built it right. I think the same thing could be said about our country. Our, a good framework can abide a few bad people. Okay, a good framework can abide a few bad people. Yes, there are people that, that look at our government, look at our constitution, look at, at um, the branches of government and the checks and balances, and they are trying to fundamentally change that. And yet we have a good framework that can hold up, that can stand up against that if we continue to follow those principles. See, our founding fathers <clears throat> built our country with biblical blueprints. Now, I'm not saying that they were all Christians. Some of them weren't. Some of them were deists. I think a vast majority of them were, and we have evidence that, that shows they were believers. But not everyone in our founding fathers were Christians and, and our nation isn't a Christian nation. Now, before you just all get up and walk out the door, just hear me out, okay? Nations, organizations, bands can't be Christians. Only people can be Christians, okay? Hear, hear me. <laughs> okay, I remember being a teenager like, liking Christian bands and there are a lot of these bands that if I based my faith on them, I would be very far from Jesus right now because they, they had great lyrics, but the theology was about an inch deep. They, 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 they had real great voices and, and you know, um, they sounded good, but they weren't deep in God's word and therefore they, they went all different areas, okay? If you, 
if you trust in, in organizations or, 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 or in nations, you're going to be disappointed, okay? Only people can be Christians. What I'm saying is this, they organize our country around some biblical principles, and I want to highlight just a few quickly, okay? Let's look at three principles that our, our country was organized around. Let's look at our Declaration of Independence. We're going to put it up on the screen. It starts out, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Man, they, <laughs> at least when it was founded, it was, it was self-evident. They would say, you can look at this and you just, you just knew. It was just obvious. It was common sense, self-evident that all men, meaning mankind, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There are two are right there. Number one, <clears throat> saying that, that all people were created by God. All people were created. Therefore, all human life has value. And it is right there in our founding documents that all human life has value. That was the worldview in which we were framing our constitution with it. Every human life has value before God. And there are, are implications because of that. Implications in what we do with those who are sick, those who are in the womb, those who, who are, are elderly and, and have different uh, uh, challenges. All human life has value. Number two, because we're created, it says then we were endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. It's saying this, our rights come from God, not government. That's huge. That is huge. Our rights come from God. And that is so important. That is so critical and, and, and needs to be clear to, to every believer. Rights come from God, not from government. You want to know why? Because what government gives... Government can take away, right? So our rights don't come from any government. Our rights come from God, and they recognize that. They enshrine that in our Constitution. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, this all sounds good and biblical principles. If that's true, then why did they allow our country to start with slavery? Why did they allow slavery to be in our Constitution? Because our, our founding fathers and our, our country coming together, it was made of people. Let, let me kind of give you an illustration. Let, let, me, let me kind of put it like this. I want you to imagine that uh, you know, tonight you're at home and you're in your bed and you're, you're fast asleep when all of a sudden you wake up to find that your house is on fire, okay? And so like panic, we've got to get out of this house. You start running around and you, you run out of your bedroom and you make your way into your living room. And as you get in your living room, you realize that there is someone in there robbing you. There is a thief in your living room. And so they push you over, they knock you down and you break your arm. Now, let me ask you, <laughs> What is your number one priority in that moment? Is it, is it to mend your broken arm? Is it to catch the thief? Or is it to get out of the burning house? What's your priority? Right? It's to get out of the house first. Then you can address the other very important issues. But your, your top priority is getting out of the dangerous situation. See, when our country was founded, we had some issues. Okay? It, was, it was 13 individual colonies all coming together. There were some issues that had to be dealt with. But it was also, also built with principles that our founding fathers knew would take root. And they gave them tools so that as time went on, it would flourish. And they would be able to fix those issues. Okay? That yes, there was issues when our country was founded. But as you look at our country, over time, we have... by in a large sense, believers coming together and calling our government to say, this is not right. This is not just. This is not lining up with biblical principles. And we, the people, have called our government out and made changes. But that leads to principle number three. Okay, principle number three is this. They recognize our capability for evil. They recognize humanity's capability for evil. That, that they didn't assume that everyone is just good. That if, if humans are left to our, to our own devices, that we would all just be good and kind and we would treat everyone, you know, just, just lovely. No, they recognize the idea that absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why there are three branches of government, because there are checks and balances built in. See, humans, we have a bent toward evil and self-centeredness. That's why when certain laws were kind of um, downgraded from, from felonies to misdemeanors, we saw an uptick in those crimes. That's why there's a, a person who attends our church that's involved in uh, the, the justice system. And they said, you know, that um, 
that, 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 that people have, have uh, I don't want to give too much away, but basically there are people that, that they, they got caught committing a crime and uh, they end up calling their buddy from the jail and, and they're talking about what happened. And, and the buddy said, wait, 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 where did you do this? And they found out they were in El Dorado County. He said, oh, what did you do? They prosecute criminals in El Dorado County. You're out of luck, man. The criminals know these things. That's why. That's why some companies who behave badly, they've done the math. There are whole departments that do the math to find out what the cost of liability and, and uh, lawsuits would be. And they factored in that it's a cost of doing business and they've made a choice to behave badly because we're making this much profit over here and it outweighs the, the bad things that we're doing. Do we naturally, do humans naturally choose to do the right thing? Proverbs 29, 18 says it like this. It says, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. Meaning, when humans can't see the benefits or the consequences of their actions, they will throw off restraint. That's why the sword will always be necessary until Jesus returns. The sword will always be necessary until Jesus returns because, because we live in a fallen world with, with humans that's hearts have not been regenerated yet by Jesus. But the incredible thing about our system of government is that we get to be a part of deciding who holds that sword. We get to be a part of deciding who they give that sword out to. And if those who are holding the sword, they're not holding it re responsibly, guess what? We can come and take it away from them through elections. Okay, I just want to be <laughs> clear about that, okay? Typically. <clears throat> okay, and give it to someone else. We have a say in how this is done, which is an incredible privilege that so many people around the world, they do not share in. They do not be, there are so many people that are not a part of a representative form of government where they don't have a vote or a voice in what happens in their government. So we have to be very careful that we don't take that for granted or that we lose sight of, of what really matters in these issues and all the noise that's going on around us. Because come on, let's be honest, there's a lot of noise right now, isn't there? There is a lot of noise and a lot of conflicting voices and what is real and what is true in our culture around us. So to help us stay focused, I want to real quickly, I know it's Labor Day weekend. I, I want to real quickly, I want to look at two wrong questions right from scripture when it comes to politics, two wrong questions that we need to avoid. So if you're following around, along in the Bible, the first one is found in Joshua chapter five. You can turn there if you like, Joshua chapter five. And in Joshua chapter five, the Israelites are making their way into the promised land led by Joshua. Make, makes sense, right? And so here they are, they're getting ready for their first real big challenge, their first big uh, campaign against the, the city of Jericho, okay? And so into this, one day, Joshua gets up and he's walking around. Maybe he's kind of scoping out the city. Maybe he's making a battle plan. And then, uh, then this happens. Joshua five, let's look at verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Are you for us? Or are you for our enemies? Not, not a bad question. Kind of makes sense. I mean, think about it. If, you, if, if the dude was kind of approaching you with a sword in their hand or a weapon in their hand, you kind of want to know, hey, where do you stay? You know, are you, where are you at in all this? And so it makes me think, have you, have you ever found yourself in a situation where uh, you're meeting someone for the first time and you can kind of tell they're trying to figure you out? Have you ever been there? Well, you can kind of tell by, just by the subtle questions they're asking or the, the topics of conversation. They're kind of throwing breadcrumbs out there. They're trying, try, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to figure out wh what side are you on? Whose team are you on? You know, are you an intelligent, rational, good person or are you one of those? And I'll let you fill in the blank of what one of those is, but okay. Why are they doing that? Because they want to put us in a box. They want, to, they want to put everyone with an R or a D or whatever it might be, and then they've completely defined who you are and what you're about. And the question that we want to avoid is, what side are you on? But see, that's exactly what the question that Joshua is trying to answer. He's trying to figure out, hey, hey what, what side are you on? The problem is, is he wasn't talking to a man. He, he didn't recognize who he was talking to at first. So let's look at the answer. He asked, what side are you on? He replied, 
neither. Neither. She says, I, I'm not on your side and I'm not on their side. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm not an independent. I'm not of any party. He goes on, but as commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? Now, we don't know for sure who this person was, this, this individual, you know, um, it could be an angel, could be the angel of the Lord. Other, um, you know, commentaries and other you know, scholars think that this is actually a pre-incarnate Jesus, that Jesus has come down now and he is talking to Joshua. But, but regardless of that, you know, the question is, is hey, are you, are you a Democrat? Or are you a Republican? Do you think the way I do on, on immigration, on foreign wars, on the economy? I mean, hey, are you for Main Street or are you for Wall Street? And what does he say? Neither. Neither. When he asks the Lord, are you on my side, God? Or are you on their side? Do you attend this church or that church? <laughs> neither. Why? Why would he say that? Because neither side gets it 100% right. They will emphasize and elevate one value over another at the expense of another. They'll, they'll, they'll elevate mercy and compassion at the cost of justice and order. Oh, the only, the only thing that matters is, is being merciful and compassionate. And yet, then others get harmed. Or you can flip it. It's, it's the reverse. They, they, they will elevate order and justice at all costs. And yet, people are still being hurt in the process. Let me say this. The, I'm going to get in trouble. The excesses of untethered capitalism leads to greed. I would say it like this. Capitalism without a compass and I would say that the scriptures are our compass. Capitalism without a compass leads to greed. Socialism, the idealism of socialism, which doesn't account for human nature, leads to laziness and grift. Neither side is right and neither side is static because they change. Parties change. Politicians, they, politicians are not thermostats. They don't set the temperature. They're thermometers. They tell you the temperature. Oh, it looks like it's getting hot outside. I better tell everybody to get in the swimsuit. Oh, wait, oh, no, it's getting cold. Okay, let's, let's all put on a winter coat. They don't set the temperature. They just tell you what they think the temperature is, what we want to hear oftentimes. Not, not every politician, don't get me wrong. But they change. Okay, if you go back just a few years ago, you look at some of the parties had different stances on marriage, but their stance evolved. Different stances on, on race and on, on, on war. See, Oftentimes, politicians will compromise to win elections. But let me tell you something. Jesus isn't running for office. Yeah. Jesus isn't running for office, and he doesn't want your vote. He doesn't need your vote. It doesn't matter if you vote for him or not. He's a king, not a president. Okay? He's not after your vote. He's after our heart. And as believers, our association with any political party must always be temporary. Our association with any political party, it always has to be temporary. See, well, are you on the right or are you on the left? Neither. We don't stand on the right or on the left. We stand behind. We stand squarely behind King Jesus. Okay? That is the safest place to be. In every political situation we're going to face in this, this election season, every question that comes up, we're not asking, is it, is it right or is it left? We're asking, where's Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, that has to be your question. Where is Jesus on this? And guess what? It's not, probably not going to be where you think it's going to be. And it's not going to be holy on one side or another. Jesus, he doesn't stand right or left. He stands above and he judges the nations. And he's the only one who has the authority to do that. So we'll align ourselves with the Lord and Scripture regardless of any part, where any party stands. Because sometimes being a follower of Jesus means that we have to kind of stand in the, in the prophetic, meaning we have to call out the side that we would typically align with. Okay, there'll be times we have to say, you know, <clears throat> hey, we support you here, here, and here, but hey, over here, that's compromise. That, that doesn't line up with the values of Scripture. I can't support that. Yeah, yeah we, we love that you've been so good over here on these issues. You, you've been great over here, but I can't, I can't remain silent on this. I have to speak up. Okay, and we have to call our side that we would land on, on out. 
Why? First Timothy 3.15, why do we have to do this? Why? See, politicians need to recognize that, that as believers, we are not a voting block. Our, our vote for them is not permanent and perfect. You can't, can't count on the church to always, well, you know what? I know they say this is important, but we'll give them the judges they want. And then we can kind of just change our mind on these other issues and they won't really care much. They'll be rah-rah for our team. Our vote is not perfect or permanent. Now we're going to get into it as this series goes, because yes, I, I don't live in a perfect world, meaning I have to make a choice. I have to choose which side aligns the most with Jesus. Okay, and we have to make that choice and it's a messy decision. I wish there were perfect candidates out there. I wish there was a party line that would completely line up with where I stand and what I, I think the Bible says, but we still have to make that decision. Okay, why does this matter? First Timothy 3 verse 15. He says this, but if I'm delayed, if I'm delayed, I write so you may know how to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of of the truth. What is he saying? He said, come on, in our crazy world, the church, the church is the, the pillar and the ground of the truth. We have to be about the truth and speak the truth. As, as followers of Jesus, as his church, we have to be about the truth. We, we have no other, there, there is no other way. We have to be about the truth and speak the truth. And, and at times that means, you know, we're going to be the place that, that, people are going to walk away from. I would love to have our church full of the entire county. I would, I would love that. And, 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 but I'd rather have conversations five, 10 years from now when, when people come up to us and say, you know, you said the truth when I was not in a place to hear it. You held firm to the truth. I, I wasn't ready to hear it then. I didn't want to receive it then. I was, I was going this direction, but you told me the truth when no one else would. See, yes, I want us to be a church that is, that is warm and welcoming, and you can come in with whatever beliefs you have and wherever you find yourself. And no matter what you did last night, you can have a chair here on Sunday morning. You're welcome. But we still have to tell the truth. And we still have to be honest. And we still have to hold true to what Scripture says. And then when you go out there in your lives, that, that's, my, that's my responsibility, to tell the truth. Well, then when you go out there in your lives and you are coworkers and friends and neighbors, people would be amazed. Like, I, I don't understand. Like, like, I know when I talk to them that they believe this about this issue, but they are the nicest, the kindest, the most genuine, the most forgiving people. Like, it, it's, I, don't, I don't understand. How can they believe this political thing and yet behave like this? It makes no, because we're not right or left. We are behind the king. That's how we can do that. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay, I got time for one more question. I'm going to try to go quick. Question number two. And then the place, you can turn to, to Acts chapter one. I think the placement of this question is really interesting because this is right after Jesus has risen from the dead and he is now walking around, hanging out with his disciples. He's spending 40 days, you know, explaining what the scriptures meant. He's going through the Old Testament prophecies and scriptures and he's telling them what that, that means and he's doing it with holes in his hands and his feet. Can you imagine what that must be like? I mean, here's the disciples are. They spent the last three and a half years watching Jesus perform miracles, hearing this incredible teaching and now the last couple weeks with the risen Savior. Into this, one of the guys raises his hand and asks a question. Acts 1 verse 6 <clears throat> Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> what are they doing? They're asking Jesus a political question. It, 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 it's a political, but it's also a very practical question. See, the disciples have still misunderstood Jesus' mission. Jesus, you won. <laughs> you won on the cross. You're back. You're victorious. Are you going to come in and now take over the government and finally do all those things you've been talking about? Are we going to see that happen? You know what they're asking Jesus? They're basically asking him, when are we going to win? When are we going to win, Jesus? When are you going to take the country back and, and we're going to have godly values? There's going to be prayer in school and we're going to stop all these evil laws. When do we win, Jesus? But here's the issue. They, they, they thought the answer was an earthly kingdom. 
which makes sense because that's all they've ever known. Okay, all they've known were, were earthly kingdoms. And if you think of like King David, who had these incredible victories. And I think of King Solomon with his, his wisdom and, and, and prosperity and the peace that was going on. But the problem is, is as good as these kingdoms were, these administrations were, they were all temporary. They all ended. And, and in fact, they ended and then they got passed to some other people that were not so great and the policies didn't continue. See, Jesus, it would have been very easy for Jesus when he rode in on the donkey and everybody was cheering for him and he was, his poll numbers were really, really good. It would have been easy for him to establish an earthly kingdom and he could have done that and it would have been popular and it would have been profound and it would have been temporary. Jesus didn't want to establish an earthly kingdom. He was looking to establish an eternal kingdom and how that operates, now that that starts out, looks different. See, I think we put too much weight into elections. Not to say that they don't matter because, come here, hear me, hear me. They do. Elections have consequences. We have seen that. If we haven't seen that over the last few years, elections have consequences. But I think we put too much hope in our national elections. We think if we just elect the right person, you know, everything's going to change and they're going to fix everything and they're going to bring our nation back to God. But it rarely works out like that, does it? It rarely works out that way. <clears throat> and on the other hand, when election doesn't go the way we'd like it to go, we, we kind of, you know, we kind of get into a, a, a black cloud kind of kind of hovers over us and there's despair. And I've experienced it myself. I remember back, you know, uh, several election, election cycles ago when an election didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. I thought like, I thought I had the pulse of the, the country and I thought, oh yeah, they're not going to go along with this. We're going to change things. And then it didn't go the way I thought it was going to go. And I was like, oh, I remember going to work the next day, just kind of being bummed and down and like, oh, I can't believe this. America has rejected God. This is the end of our nation. But then I remembered another election. Another election. I remembered when Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate. And they brought up Barabbas. And they said, choose. Who do you want? Do you, do you want me to release Jesus? Or do you want me to release Barabbas? And I, I bet at first the disciples were like, oh, this is going to be easy. Come on, everyone sees it. So easy. Do you want Jesus or do you want a murderer? And yet they were shocked and surprised. The election, first election, first, first ballot measure didn't go the way they thought it was going to go. And they probably thought this is the worst outcome that could ever happen. How can we ever recover from this? What they didn't realize, it looked like they lost, but Jesus was winning a far greater victory than they could see in that moment. Okay? Jesus was winning. Even when sometimes, sometimes when it looks like we're losing, Jesus still wins. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back. Listen to Jesus, how Jesus answers their question. When they ask, are, are we going to win? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. I love Jesus. He's so consistent. He's like, mm, I'm not going to answer that question. I didn't answer to Joshua, and I'm not going to answer your question. You want to know why? Because my purposes are not dependent on an election. My purposes are not dependent on who's in the White House or who is in the State House. Look at what he says instead. He says, he says are we going to win? And Jesus says, no, no, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, I've got something so much better than politicians and parties for you. I want to give you my power. I want to give you Holy Spirit power. If you'll get, if you'll get aligned with me, those, those goals you want to see accomplished, you're so desperate to see these things happen. If you would get aligned with me, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Not by, by, not by might nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Last story. When the Apostle Paul was on his missionary journeys, he came to the city of Corinth. And Corinth was a very different place. They had thousands and thousands of temple prostitutes. It was part of the daily life. And you talk about like trans ideology, it was, it was on, on, on full display in Corinth. There was so much moral depravity and moral decay. In other situations, Paul, he was, he was able to kind of 
have conversation and make illustrations and kind of talk through things and reason with people. But listen to what he says about Corinth. He says this, when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence and human wisdom. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He's saying, hey, hey, the culture here in this community this time, the, so far gone, so far gone, I wasn't able to, to reason with you. We couldn't sit down and have a, a rational conversation. I couldn't find common ground. I tried. I thought, you know, people are rational. So if we just talk about this. They're going to see reason. Paul's like, no, they wouldn't happen here. The culture was too far gone. So you know what it needed? The only thing that worked, the power of God. The power of God. Come on, church, I got to say, and I think I'm talking to the right group of people because you're here on Labor Day weekend. <laughs> We need the power of God again. We so desperately need the power of God, yeah, in our churches, in our families, in our daily lives. We need to cry out and say, God, I need you to empower me because they're asking questions I don't know the answers to. And every time I've tried to have a conversation, they just, it, it, they're just stonewalling. They, they won't get through. I need you to do what only you can do. We need the power of God. Holy Spirit, empower me. You know what will make a difference? A word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. You're sitting down with a coworker or someone and they, they just see the world completely differently. Maybe it's a son or daughter. And in that moment, a thought comes to you from heaven. And you just open your mouth and you just speak and you have no idea where it came from. It's not you, you didn't know anything. And, and you just talk about a situation in their life. You speak about something that's going on. And and something breaks open, their heart cracks open a little bit, and now they're open to hear you. It's a miracle. You find the boldness to pray for healing for someone who is sick, someone who has a, a disease or something that's going on, and you pray for them. And, and it's like, I don't know how this is going to work. I can't heal anybody, but I feel like I'm supposed to pray for them. And you pray for them, and God does a miracle. Imagine what could happen. When we stand up before, he told the, the apostles, you're going to stand before kings and rulers. That might look like school boards and, and homeowner associations. And he says, don't worry about what to say. I'll give you the words to say. And there's supernatural boldness. We need God's power. Do you know how we get God's power? Okay, it's a little cheesy, but go with me. Sometimes you need to get, get on your knee bones and ask God for some backbone so we can exercise our jawbone. I think that's where we're at right now. That we need to get on our knees and ask God, God, would you give me courage to know when to open my mouth? Not to be a jerk but to know when to boldly open my mouth and proclaim truth. It makes a difference. I think that's where we are at. See, the Lord empowered that small group of believers, desperate for him, desperate for him. They had no buildings, they had no money, they had no political backing, and yet God took this small group of people and they transformed the known world into a culture where things like abortion were, were just common. It was so commonly practiced. They didn't, they didn't come to a place where, where in just a few couple hundred years, they didn't just, just make abortion illegal. They made it unthinkable. They made it so an entire culture said, no, we couldn't think of doing that. Just taking our babies and sacrificing them, which is what they did. It was very common. We talked about that in our Christmas message. I know Christmas, right? He did it before. He can do it again. But remember that first verse we read? Our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior from there. And about you, my savior's not coming from Washington. My savior's not coming from Sacramento. My savior is coming from heaven and he can change a culture. And there are ways that we do that. Yes, yes, political action, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about voting and getting involved and what that looks like. But it starts first with us being on our knees and asking God, empower us. Empower us, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we need you. We need your presence. We need your power. We need you to come and do again what only you can do. Lord, as we're walking through this divisive political season, everyone is looking at, at sides. Would you help us to align ourselves with you? Lord, that in every question that comes up, every debate, we would be looking for you, Jesus. That where are you, where are you at in this, Jesus? I'm standing with you. 
as we're praying this morning, I wanna just encourage you, would you ask the Lord, am I standing on ideology in some area of my life rather than scripture? Is there any area in my life where I'm putting more hope in, in politics than I am in you, Jesus? than I am in your scriptures. Would you show me that? Others, you're asking the question, when are we gonna win? But it's not out of hatred, it's, it's out of a broken heart. Your heart is broken for what you see taking place around you. The good news is we have already won. Our ultimate victory is secure with Jesus, but he wants to fill you with power. Power to face whatever it is that's gonna come our way in this next season. Just a moment, we're going to open this altar area up. We're going to sing a song. And I want to encourage you, if you need fresh power, if you need fresh wisdom, if you need God to empower you to go out and have those conversations, to be around people that, that believe very differently from you, you need his power. Would you ask him for it? Would you ask him for his Holy Spirit power? For some, maybe you're disappointed by politics and political leaders. You're always gonna be disappointed because we will always be disappointed when we expect government to do what only God can do. Political season, we get all stirred up. We hear these speeches and, and we think, oh, it's gonna change this time. You will always be disappointed if you're expecting government to do what only God can do. This morning, I wanna give you an opportunity. If you'd say, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm ready to make him my Lord and Savior. I want to put all my hope in Him. If that's you, I'm just going to invite you to raise your hand and put it down. Say, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Well, if I didn't see your hand, I'd love to talk with you at the end of the service. I'll be available out in our connection corner. Father God, thank you so much that we have the privilege of living in the time that we live. Lord, would you help us to stand right behind you, the safest place to be in all the chaos. Lord, help us to find you in every situation and stand with you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm gonna invite you to stand to your feet at this time if you're able to. We're gonna close with a song of worship. We'll have members of our prayer team here in the front. They'd love to encourage you in prayer. Let's take a few moments and respond to the Lord. Let's make this our prayer. Open the eyes 